for who you are. We thank you for your great name. We thank you for your great salvation. We thank you for your great love towards us. And Father, I just pray tonight that we would be challenged in our hearts in the areas of, of our lives that aren't focused solely on you in the selfish parts of our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would surrender those parts to you tonight. We would walk out of here with the burdens off of our shoulders, trusting you and leaning into you and your salvation for us and your sanctification. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray that you would be glorified and magnified in our hearts and in our minds as we lift you up in praise tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus for your name tonight as we praise you God we just we just want you to be lifted high in our hearts and we we uh is the next next song we sing is bless the Lord oh my soul Lord I pray that we would be not only just singing to you but commanding our souls to bless you we come in here sometimes with with downcast spirits we say why are you downcast bless the Lord oh my soul put your hope in God tonight. So let's all stand and let's sing this out.
worship a holy God.
you are our soon returning king. We thank you that you are our savior and our king. And we praise you because you are holy, 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 and we are not. You are righteous and justice and grace and mercy and truth. And we have, as the song says, fallen from you. But you so love the world that you sent your only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And what a glorious truth that is for all of us tonight. We thank you for that. We thank you for sending your son to die for us. And we pray that your spirit would challenge us tonight, convict us tonight, encourage us where we need to be encouraged, Lord. Grow us in those areas where you are the only one who gives the increase. Fill our spirits with the fruit of your spirit. We ask that tonight, Lord. We praise you. We sing to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we worship you. Amen. 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 Good evening. So, before we get started tonight, um, as is our custom, when we know that someone has a birthday, we do our very level best to embarrass the heck out of them <laughs> and sing happy birthday. But nobody has a birthday tonight, no, so, no, I'm just kidding. Deborah Swagger's birthday is today. Let's give her a big hand. Deborah, stand up, do a little twirl so everybody can see you. Okay, let's sing happy birthday to Deborah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Dear Deborah, happy birthday to you. So make sure you give Deborah a hug and wish her happy birthday. And I won't tell you who told me to do that. Okay, tonight we're going to continue with the book of Haggai. And uh, I'm just going to, Jackie did a really good job of giving the background of this particular book um, at the last time he preached, which I'm not sure when that was. I'm getting old. Might have been last week, but might not have been. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, 
If you weren't here for that, I would encourage you to go to BuellBibleChurch.com and click on media and watch that message. It was a really good message, and he did a great job of explaining the background of this particular book. I'm going to just give a little brief summary of where we've gone so far, and then we'll jump into chapter 2. Now, the purpose of Haggai's ministry was to awaken the people and encourage them in finishing the task of rebuilding God's temple. It was really easy for them to get the work started when they first got to the Holy Land because everybody was dedicated and enthusiastic. But soon they ran into trouble, and after months of trial and opposition, the work slowed and finally stopped for 16 years. In this little book, we have four sermons from Haggai, and each one of them has a specific date. In each message, Haggai points out a particular sin that will keep us from accomplishing God's will and finishing his work. So the first sin, and Jackie talked quite a bit about this um, in his previous message, is putting self ahead of the Lord. That was pretty much the summary of chapter 1. So in chapter 1, Haggai begins by pointing out their selfishness. They had built their own houses, but they said it was not time to build God's house. In other words, they were putting self ahead of the Lord. Some of the Jews had built extremely luxurious homes for themselves for that time period, and that's where we that's what the scripture describes as paneled homes. This but this sin of putting ourselves before the Lord remains with us all the way to today. We put our own desires ahead of the will of God. How easy is it to make excuses for not doing God's work. I hear them all the time, and I'll be honest with you, I'm guilty of convincing myself of those excuses as well. Here's one of my favorites. I ask, hey brother, will I see you at church for Sunday service, Bible study, discipleship? And you answer, yes, Lord willing. Now I could be wrong, But I'm pretty sure the Lord is willing for you to attend those functions. Or how about these? (laughs) How about these? How about these excuses? The weather is too bad to go visiting the sick or to attend church. But it's not too bad for a hunting trip or a shopping spree. (laughs) I know I'm I'm hitting the the buttons there. Uh, People will sit through a doubleheader baseball game or a double feature movie and never complain, never get a thought to the time, but they start to fidget if a church service runs five minutes over. Get ready to fidget. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Haggai warns us that we really lose out when we put ourselves ahead of God. In in, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, he tells us that our earnings vanish away and our possessions fail to last when God is left out. God held back the rain, and for this reason the crops failed. That's verse 10 and 11. After after all, the Jews knew God's promise that he would bless their land if they honored him, but they did not trust his word, so they lost the blessing. They allowed circumstances to dictate their faith. Such an easy thing to do. We, you know, when everything is going well, our faith is strong, isn't it? But then things start to turn, and we go, God, where are you? What's up with this? And that's okay. God's big enough to, to handle our questions and our doubts. But it's particularly in those times that we should cling to our faith and trust that what he's doing will be the best thing for us. Now, Haggai's message about repentance in chapter 1 was received with real conviction, And the leaders become stirred to do God's will. I am with you, promised the Lord. I will be glorified. And I think it's important to note here that this whole project was a spiritual venture. It wasn't just simply a work of the flesh. God's people rose up and they put the Lord first in their lives. But as often happens, discouragement and discontentment slow or stop our progress. And this brings us to the second sin, which we see in the openings of chapter 2. That sin is looking back instead of looking ahead. Jackie talked about this in his message as well. 
So let's read chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. It says, In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to, Zer- to Zerubbabel, the son of, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So let's back up to verse number one. According to verse number one, this message comes on the 21st day of the seventh month, and that's a little less than a month after the people had begun to build. They started out really strong, but it just didn't last. Has that ever been your experience in life? It's it's mine. It's, It's mine more often than I care to admit. It looks like the work had already slowed down or maybe even stopped altogether because Haggai tells them to take courage and get on with the work in verse number four. We must not miss this message because if we're honest, we're all too often like the workers described in this text. We fail to listen to God's encouragement, we forget about the future, and we long for the past. Have you ever sat around and talked about the glory days? Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about it. I won't quote it because it talks about going to a bar, but he talks about how we get older and we think about the days gone by and how great they were, and we fail to see the blessings in today. I don't know about you guys, but that happens to me all the time. When I hang around with the the guys in the church and that are my age, mostly we talk about our ailments. And, and we remember the days when we got out of bed without moaning and groaning, and we didn't have the aches and pains we had. We remember the glory days. And it's okay to remember the good times and be grateful for them. God wants us to learn from the past, but he doesn't want us to live there. Verse 3 shows why the people have become so discouraged in their work. Haggai asks, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So what's going on here is simply this. The workers are bummed. That's a biblical word, by the way. The workers are bummed because they remember how glorious the temple used to be. At one time, this temple was just an amazing place. It was the temple that Solomon built. Less than 70 years earlier, it had stood in this very spot, and it was the crowning achievement of Solomon. For centuries, it had been the center of worship for the Jews, the very dwelling place of God's spirit. They were looking to the past and comparing the memories of the glory days with what they were building today. How do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your sight, Haggai asks? It's almost as if they were saying, what's the use? Nothing will ever compare to the glory of Solomon's temple. We're wasting our time on this piece of junk. We lived without it for all these years. Why not just hang on to our memories of the glory days and of the original temple? And so, because of this attitude, They begin to slack in their work. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this sound familiar to you? 
Has this ever been your experience in your life? It does to me. It's way easier to get discouraged when we face obstacles than it is to be faithful and trust and continue to move forward. It's easy to get discouraged as we seek to do God's work. And just for the record, God's work doesn't necessarily mean front and center church work. This idea of secular work versus ministry work is a false idea. All work, when you do it to the glory of God, is ministry work. All work should be done, putting God first, no matter what it is. Maybe for you, God's called you to be a leader in the church. But maybe he's called you to clean bathrooms and straighten chairs. Maybe your ministry is preparing and serving a meal for someone sick or in need. Maybe your ministry is to be a godly mother, a godly father, a godly husband, or a godly wife. That's a ministry we should all pour ourselves into.